welcome to the Spotlight Edition of SCM Live. We're doing something new today. We're going to take a one part of the SCM family and showcase it. We're going to include collectors, dealers, market experts, and more. In today's episode, we visit with Bill Noon and Symbolic International. We're going to take a look at four cars that Bill has for sale, very special cars. A Maserati 300S, Lancia Aurelia Spider, a lightweight Alpha Sprint, and a Porsche 930 Turbo. Now, Bill's have been, and Symbolic have been advertisers with SCM for more than three decades. Bill, let's jump right in. Let's describe the collector car market in just one word. Uh, good, good afternoon, Keith. Um, so my one word would be feverish, just like the, the COVID-19 thing that's going around. Um, since it hit, uh, people have been either bored or just don't know what to do with themselves, or they're really paying attention and thinking that they can get some deals because they've been very aggressive buys lately. Have you seen a certain pattern to the buys, certain kinds of cars, pre-wars, American classic, muscle cars, sports cars, or all over the map? All over the map, across the board, uh, but they're very opportunistic, cherry-picking type buyers. These are uh, fairly educated, knowing what they're looking for. And a lot of cases, I've seen one trend where it's a car they wanted before, didn't buy it, and now see a, a potential opportunity before things move in another direction and go up over the next cycle. So, Bill, if you say people are cherry picking, that implies that some people are deciding to get out and kind of selling at a, almost a distressed price. Are we seeing that? I, I did initially, uh, starting at about mid-March all the way through to about mid-April, we did see a, a handful of those kind of sales. I, I know a 288 GTO that traded hands. Uh, the guy had had it forever. He was not a seller at any price. And he let it go for favorably reasonable money. And one of my Porsche clients bought it. He jumped on it. Uh, not that he actually wanted the specific car. He just thought it was just a giveaway price. And he was very clever. A few more <laughs> happened like that. But most of the sales have been, um, again, opportunistic. Somebody heard about a car. Uh, somebody put something up for sale. Uh, somebody really wanted that specific vehicle. Or in my case, I had a lot of cars uh, right up till uh, March 15th, March 17th this year that I had had for quite a while in inventory. They were sitting on the floor, in some cases, three years. And then all of a sudden, over a 45-day period, everything was gone. I, was, so Bill, I, bought, I went down to, go ahead. How picky are buyers today? Uh, ultra fussy. They've never been more demanding. They want the best for the best price. And what kind of proof do they demand of the history of a car? Um, most of them will go full out, full, absolute. They want 500, 600 photos. If they're not inspecting themselves, they'll want videos. Um, they'll want to see every single part number, every serial number, every date code. Uh, they'll want to see wiring diagrams, wiring looms, I should say. Uh, they'll want to see all inside panels of the cars. Um, they'll want to have, uh, in one case, we had a guy that wanted a boroscope look on the inside of the liners of an engine. Uh, they're pretty demanding individuals. And history and provenance all the way back. They want to see every single owner, every registration, no, no gaps, no mistakes. If there's any kind of serious question, does that just kick the car out instantly? Not necessarily. If an owner can do his, uh, or a seller can do his research and, and uh, come back and say, explain why something is the way it is, um, a lot of times that you'll find, so a good example would be, you know, a car that raced in the period and then it got modified after its race days for road use. So there is some understanding there. Okay, so yeah, the car was a race car, but now it's being driven on the street. You got to make it a little bit more practical for the road use. So we have seen a few applications like that, but in general, it's long, if it's been modified beyond its original configuration day um, as delivered, it's probably going to be a car that's not going to sell. So before we start talking to you about your cars today, I want to thank our sponsors of this Spotlight edition of SCM Live. That's Bruce and Spencer Trenery at Fantasy Junction, Bill Noon here at Symbolic International, and David and Linda Wilson at Inner Cities Lines. Now, we wouldn't have an SCM show unless we had an SCM special. We have a super price today on a subscription, uh, which you can share with your friends. If you go to sportscarmarket.com slash Zoom, you'll get 25% off your print subscription. You'll get a digital subscription, which will be delivered to you today. You get that for $52. That's $4.33 a month, which is less than a latte. You can share this uh, offer with your friends at sportscarmarket.com slash Zoom. So let's start with our cars today. Bill, show, what, you've got four cars we're going to talk about. What's the first? Uh, I thought we'd go in order of oldest and alphabetical. So the oldest is a 1955 Alfa Romeo Sprint Veloci Allegorita, one of the factory lightweights. And it's a very interesting story. Right now it's for sale on Bring a Trailer, and the auction is actually closing tomorrow morning. 
this is a car that was sold in KD format. So it was in a knockdown situation. It was just back from Italy on a, on a uh, pallet with the wheels disassembled from the car with the engine out and the gearbox out of the vehicle. And it was imported to Mexico by Willys Mexicana. Um, they were the Willys dealership here in the States with the satellite operation in Mexico. And they allowed the car to go into Mexico without any duty. Otherwise, it would have been 100% import fees if it had been brought in as a complete vehicle. So on arrival in Mexico, it, they installed the engine, they installed the gearbox, and they put the wheels on the car. And then they put a small little brass plate on it that said, made in Mexico. And how did you find this car, Bill? Well, uh, it, a very interesting story. So this car was raced by a very famous race car driver named Freddie Van Buren. He bought the car new. And him and his co-driver, Velasquez, drove the car all the way from Mexico City, all the way to Sebring, Florida in 1958, raced it at the 12 hours of Sebring, won their class, finished 18th overall, and then drove it back to Mexico and continued to race it. And most of these cars are pretty fragile. They don't have any insulation on them. They rust out really badly. Uh, accidents are kissed to death on them. Most of them just disintegrated into the ground. This one went off the road in the early 60s, got parked in an alley in Mexico City, and it stayed there until it was rediscovered in 2009. Now, the family that owned it, they never threw it away. They realized what it was, and they kept it. And they even kept the registration card all the way into the 80s, but they didn't have the, the time or the patience to restore it. So it got sold to a Mexican client of mine, and I got it in trade on a 200 SI Maserati. And then it spent a decade being restored, and it just finished two weeks ago at Motion Products. So, so Bill, uh, this car, my understanding is this car has got a 1750 motor and a later disc brakes and a different gearbox. Yes. Yeah, so all the original, when it was restored, it was done. Alan DeCadney was the buyer of the car when it was in restoration. And Alan wanted to have a dual purpose race car. He wanted to have a road car that he could show at Pebble Beach, any concourse in the world, take it to the Millimilia with its original 1300 engine, with its original four speed gearbox, with the original drum brakes. But he also wanted to be able to switch the car over quickly to a racing 1750, a five speed wire wheels and different disc brakes on the car. So a, a competent mechanic in, in just a day can switch everything out. It's v designed to be very transparent. For this car to be accepted to the Millimilia, would you have to put it back to its original engine? Yes, you would have to swap the engine gearbox and the brakes, uh, but it already has all the do the FIVA documents and paperwork already done. And what's, what's the bidding currently at it, Bring a Trailer? Uh, it went off pretty fast, uh, pretty quickly. Normally, you don't see the bids for the last few in a few hours. Right now, it's, I think, at 126. And now my, my understanding on these lightweights, they're selling kind of in the, the very high twos to low threes. That's correct. Okay. And where do you think this car is going to end up? Probably in the same price range. Um, the, 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 the owner of the car spent over $800,000 buying the vehicle and restoring it over a 10 year period. Uh, I don't think it's going to even bring half that price. I think it's going to be, uh, my gut feeling is right around the $300,000 mark. Why do people do that? Bill, why do they spend twice what a car is worth uh, and then sell it? Hey, he, this gentleman in particular, very committed client of mine, uh, very passionate about his vehicles. He's got a 30-car collection. He's, they've changed over the years dramatically. Um, he was enamored with this vehicle and the history and swore that he was going to restore it right. What people don't realize is while they might have taken Alfa Romeo you know, two weeks to build, the restoration is incredibly complicated. Uh, these are compound curved bodies. Um, corrosion is, is, is like this one had a second battery that was put on the floorboard for the Sebring race. So the floorboard brought it out where the battery was. Um, nothing is available. You have to, if anything is missing, you have to hand fabricate it. All the components are all small, light aluminum, uh, thin steel. Um, you know, there's just not a source for getting any of the pieces. Now, fortunately, this one had everything with it. Nothing was missing. It just needed complete restoration. So the purchase price of the car back when he bought it was almost four hundred thousand dollars. The restoration ran just over four hundred thousand dollars. So this is 1956, right? The year of the car. Uh, 1957. It was built in August of 57. Seven. And sold new in new in uh, in November of 57, and then so his first race was Sebring. Bill Noon at Symbolic International. He's got a lightweight Sprint uh, up on uh, Bring a Trailer. He thinks it might bring somewhere in the three hundred thousand dollar range. At which price? It, in which case, it would be selling for half, less than half. The price of restoration. What's our next car? Uh, the next car is a 1957 Maserati 300. I'm sorry, we skipped a car. We forgot the oldest one, the 1955 Lancia Aurelia B24 Spider America. Tell us about this car. So um, it's been a favorite of mine since I was, matter of fact, it's the car that made me a car lover. Um, I, when I was very young, I had an old National Geographic uh, from the 1950s that was all about Italy. And one of the color, Kodachrome colorized photos was just so beautiful was this car right along the ocean side. 
uh, like in Portofino or someplace like that. And it had this absolutely beautiful, beautiful Italian lady in a polka dot dress leaning over the bonnet of the car. And I knew right then and there, even at 11 years old, I said, I absolutely love that car. And I really like pretty women. And what makes this car special technically? Okay, so Lancia was always uh, an innovator and an engine and engineered way beyond uh, any, what anybody else was doing. So they had monocoques in the 1920s. They had sliding pillar independent front suspension, hydraulic brakes when people were using only rear brakes and they were mechanical. Um, when these cars came along, it was derivative of the original B20 series and the B20 GT that came out in 1950. And what they did is they wanted to have an op two, two versions of the open version of the car. So Pina Farina completed two complete designs. The first one that they released was the Spider America, obviously geared towards the American market. Uh, incredibly curvaceous, monocoque, narrow angle V6, four-speed transaxle, the D on rear suspension, inboard drum brakes, engineering that just nobody else was doing this. It was just so far ahead of the curve. Um, the styling on the vehicle, even to this day, is just breathtakingly beautiful. These are and remain one of the most beautiful vehicles ever designed. Is there a big difference between the Spider America and the convertible version? Mechanically, no. And they have, share a very similar silhouette. It's when you get close to the vehicles and you look at them, you realize, okay, the Spider is light, lift, nimble, perfectly proportioned, uh, small little bumperettes, front and rear. Every place on the car you look at, you want to look closer. Uh, you just want to touch everything. You want to put your hand around the steering wheel, grab the gear lever, and go. The Cabriolet is more refined. Um, it uses a full upright window windshield. Uh, it has three-quarter vent windows. has roll-up windows. It has full insulation. So you gained a lot of weight. Um, you gained a lot of stability. Uh, but you lost the racy, sexy, raw appeal of the, uh, of the, of the original design. It's but you save like a lot of money if you, buy, if you buy the convertible. It's going to cost you a lot less. Let's look at the Spider America. I would peg that car between eight and a million two. Do you agree? Absolutely, hundred percent. And for the Cabriolet, where are we on that car? If you're really lucky today, you can buy a driver quality one in the high twos, low threes, and the best of the best is probably right at the three hundred and seventy-five to four twenty-five mark. Is it really worth the extra seven to eight hundred thousand dollars to have the Spider America? If you have the funds to buy both vehicles, only buy the Spider America. You'll never look back. If your budget only allows the Cabriolet, you're going to be in an exclusive club, just not that exclusive club. And one last question. You know, for a long time, these cars were worth nothing. I remember seeing them for $25,000, $30,000, $40,000. When did they make their giant jump into public awareness, and why do you think that happened? So they, the launches lagged behind. I mean, there were a few that knew all the way through. If you saw the people that bought them when they were new all the way through into the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they were scientists. They were entrepreneurs. They were engineers. They were people that were fairly educated. Um, while the values were minimally low for a long, long time, they shot off like a rocket after about 2005, 2010. So what happened was people were looking at California spiders, Ferrari California spiders and Maserati Vignali spiders. And that's where the focus was if you wanted a sexy Italian open car. Or if you're budget-minded, then you looked at an Alpha Spider. But all of a sudden, people started looking at these Lancia B24 Spider Americas, and they realized that these were really special vehicles. So I had, you know, 50, 51 or so California Spiders go through my hands over a 30-year period. All of a sudden, these Lancias, people were going, you know, my California Spider is now worth 5, 6, 7, 10, 15, 20 million dollars. And these launches will do everything, and they're actually a little bit prettier, and they're definitely a lot more better engineered, and they've got a way better user-friendly transaxle gearbox. And so all of a sudden at the auctions, you saw the prices going from 150, 350, 550, a million. They went all the way up to two and a half, 2.25 million dollars was the record at the, at the height of the last market. So 2.25 million. Is this, what is this car going to sell for, do you think? So this one is also going to be on Bring a Trailer. Um, and I expect it to be way back of market um, because it's just it's being sold to be sold and it's going to be an aggressive sale. But I, I don't think it's probably going to hit for more than eight and a quarter. And does, that I think mean that the market, does that mean that that market is just soft for Lancias? No, because I just sold one for a million dollars. We had another one that we, men, we spoke about this earlier. I had one that I had for sale for three years. Didn't get any phone calls on it. No emails. We but, bought but, it at the top of the market. They, you said they were at over two. That's correct. And so, so at the top of the market. This yep, is half, half price. price. Well, less than half price. So, so is this a bargain hunter's paradise? 
uh, this is, again, one of the ones that somebody's going to cherry pick out. They've always wanted one. They couldn't afford them before, and now they see it as an opportunity they don't want to miss. So we call this a symbolic uh, international blue light special? Yeah, I guess that's a good word. All right. What's our last car? What's our next car? Uh, the next one is the 1957 Maserati 300S. Um, this is uh, one of 26 cars that were built. Uh, this is the sole factory team long nose Santuzzi Spider that was built as a clean built car. So instead of being converted from an earlier in house bodywork to a long nose Santuzzi bodywork car, this one started out as a long nose Santuzzi Spider. So, what, what made the Maserati 300S so special in its era? Okay, so a lot of things. Um, if you go back, uh, my two heroes, and I spoke with them about this when they were both alive, uh, Sterling Moss or Sterling Moss and Juan Lin Mofangio, they both said the 300S was the greatest sports car ever designed. And it was basically because it did, was directly derived from the 250F, which was the greatest Formula One car ever designed uh, in, in, the, in that era. The, um, the 250F was just unstoppable. Fangio won his fifth world championship racing the 250F. And in that same year that he won the championship, he raced this car four times and had four first in place, first, in, uh, sorry, first overall finishes. So tell us about Fantuzzi and this bodywork. So um, Maduro Fantuzzi was a genius. Uh, same on the lines of Andrea Zagato. He could look at a sheet of aluminum and uh, sit down with, a, with this, a piece of paper, sketch out a design, no wind tunnel, just completely from his mind, and everything worked. They were just absolutely beautiful. The Italians were... Uh, just magnificent working with metal. And this goes back into the 1300s when they were casting bells. They were the best at making church bells and their metallurgy talents stayed with them all the way through. They could make swords, armor. Uh, and then when the, came, the automobile age came, they were just fantastic at designing. Bill, Bill, tell, so us, tell us about the history of this specific car. Okay, so this one was a works team car. It was ordered new by the this race team uh, in, the, in the fall of 1956. It was uh, completed in December of 57. It was originally fitted with an experimental fuel-injected engine, and it was built specifically to race at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Unfortunately, Maserati was on the brink of bankruptcy. So they bet all their eggs in one basket on the Formula One program, and they hired Fangio as their main driver just to race Formula One. So this car, they needed the cash. So they sold this car to a guy who was more of an investor than a, than a driver, and he never took delivery of it. And he, the factory, then reloaned the car back to Fangio in between his Formula One races. And Fangio raced it four times and took four first place finishes. And then he also won the World Championship, his fifth and final one that year. His final race of the 57 season was in, Arge was in uh, Buenos Aires. And he was racing this car. And in his autobiography, he wrote he was more afraid of losing the race in what he called a home crowd than he was of, was of losing the German Grand Prix and losing the World Championship. Uh, it really weighed on his car mind. Does this car have any questions? Does it check all the boxes? Is it 100% clean and clear exactly what it is? No. So it's 100% clean on history and ownership. Uh, but like all 300Ss, these cars floated engines and transaxles like you wouldn't believe. And most of them had multiple bodies like you wouldn't believe, too. So they started out as short noses with in-house coach work. Then they got Fantuzzi bodies. Then they got Fantuzzi long noses. Um, I mean, it's, it's just like the, the, the people that research the 250F. you got to really do your homework. The good news on this one is because it was so famous, when it was sold after its last race by Fangio, the guy that bought it didn't buy it because he wanted to go racing. He bought it because he knew it was Fangio's last race car, and he wanted to race in it, won a bunch of races in it. And he knew he could make a ton of money because somebody was going to pay a premium to get Fangio's car. And everybody that bought the car thereafter paid a massive premium to own it so they could own Fangio's car. So every moment of the car's life, from the moment it was ordered up, the moment it was built, every race it did, all the way through each owner, and every owner of this car has been a who's who of the collecting car world. This car passed through the hands of some of the most prominent collectors that ever existed. They what's, fought to get this car hard. What's the ask on this car? Six million dollars, including a one million dollar spares package, an extra engine, extra transaxle, extra brakes, extra a whole bunch of stuff. Or so if somebody had six package. to seven million dollars to spend. What would their other choices be in that price range? Uh, there's a lot of cars that could be in their price range, a lot of cars, but they're not going to, they're going to be, you know, it, they're not going to be even close to what this car can do. So you're going to be looking at things like a 200 SI Maserati, or you're going to be looking at a 500 Mondial or a 750 Monza. Um, you might be looking at a very bad 500 TRC or a very bad 500 TR, one with questionable identity. Um, 
you're not going to get this kind of performance and and uh, history for unless you start spending way more money. And they have to buy into the uh, the Ferrari 250 Testarossa range. And these cars just spin circles around all the Ferraris. And the Maserati, but nothing could touch the 300 S's. They were just so far ahead of their game, it wasn't even funny. What's our last car today? The last car is a 1989 Porsche 930 Turbo. And this one's a little bit of a rarity. This is an original code COO, which is a German domestic market version. Um, and it was finished in the perfect color combination of black, black. So it's the only modern vehicle we have for sale right now. And uh, it's quite exciting. I mean, it's, it's uh, not an expensive car by, by any measure, but just a car that you just rarely ever see coming to market. Most of these cars were thrashed, weren't they? Big time. And the bigger problem with the 89 turbos, actually all the turbos from 75 to 89, and they're on as well, is after uh, they were sold to their second or third owners, everybody wanted to you know, keep them current and competitive for the other new Porsches that were coming out. So they all got modified and fitted with you know, crank fire ignition and twin turbos and upside down gearboxes, all sorts of crazy modifications, you know, BBS wheels. So when you find an original German market car that's in its original as delivered configuration and matching numbers and rust and accident free, I mean, it's, it's, it just doesn't happen that often. It's a real rarity. How would you define the difference between these turbos, the 930s, the first gen like this, and later turbos? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not normally noted for my Porsche enthusiasm, but I am a huge Porsche fan, uh, just in secret. I actually have a couple of Porsches in my own collection. So if you want to have the rawest, crudest, wildest Porsche turbo, you buy a 75, but you're going to be spending probably the better part of a decade finding one. So they made 250-ish of them. Uh, Bob Snodgrass, who keeps the registry, thinks about 100 of them survive. Uh, out of those, maybe 20 are worth buying. But they are literally dangerous cars. They have no ability to control. If you're a bad driver and you get one of these cars, they call them a Widowmaker for a reason. So they started refining the cars each year. 76 and 77s were a little bit more refined. Then in 79, 78 and 79, they got an intercooler. They went off market in the U.S., but still kept being sold rest, around the rest of the world all the way through. Back in 86, they came back to the States, now even more refined with a 3.3 liter engine. And then in the final year of the G model production, they finally fitted a five-speed gearbox, the G50 five-speed gearbox, instead of the original four-speed. And it totally transformed the car because you could find all the sweet spots on the torque curve using the turbo boost. And they became a cult classic like you wouldn't believe. And they were only partially eclipsed when the 964 Turbo 36s came out in 1994. And what's the ask on this car? Uh, this is the only one we're actually selling off the showroom floor, and it's 159. And how long have you had it? Um, it's actually technically not ready for sale just yet. It's being serviced <laughs> right now. It only arrived a couple of weeks ago, and it's out for services and safety checks and new tires. It'll probably be actually ready for delivery in uh, seven to ten days. So, Bill, you've taken us on quite a journey today. Before we do a wrap up, uh, let me offer once more our viewers the sports car market. Uh, we'll call it the symbolic international special here. Uh, you go to sportscarmarket.com slash Zoom. And Bill, uh, you told me earlier that if anybody pays list price for any of these cars, you'll give them a lifetime subscription to Sports Car Market. Is that correct? 100%. Absolutely. It has to happen in the next 10 minutes, though, right? <laughs> no, unlimited time. Not a problem. Okay. Well, so Bill, as we very quickly I appreciate all the time you've taken with this. Let's go back through the cars we've looked at. The Alonsia Aurelia Spider. Which is a did you want to do a Did you want to do a video tour of, it, of them very quickly? Uh, sure. Why don't we try that? So here, the first car is the 1956, 55 or 56, Bill? 55. 55, Lancia Aurelia. Spy. Now, show us the curved windshield that you're talking about, that, that how you identify the Spider versus the convertible. So it's very Americanized. It's tilt forward. Uh, double compound curves, completely curvaceous. Um, the hip line of the car is very, very pronounced. Um, no, there are no flat panels on the entire vehicle. Even the rockers curve in. Um, you'll notice also that the doors have no, they're hollow pocket doors and it uses side curtains rather than having actual windows on it. One of the most interesting things about this car was owned by the Lancia family. And so the steering wheel is from a D50 Grand Prix car. And the back side of the steering wheel right here is actually in stamped with the serial number D50-0005, which I believe is one of the Ascari championship cars. Okay, the next vehicle, else? go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the next vehicle is the um, 1957 Alfa Romeo. Um, uh, 
Sprint Veloci Alagarita. This is the lightweight that was found in Mexico, the car that took first in class at Sebring in 1958 with Freddie Van Buren. Um, this is a completely, it has all of the original engine, gearbox, all the original body panels, but it also right now is fitted with a hot rod 1750 engine and a five-speed gearbox and front disc brakes. So Bill, I, I have a question. I find those rectangular driving lights in the front jarring. Why did you decide to leave them there? So they were fitted to the car for Sebring. You needed supplemental lights for Sebring because when it got dark there, um, you had a lot of problems seeing. You had a lot of people in the background and a lot of lights that blinded people out on the track, the drivers. And so you definitely needed supplemental lighting. And this car, the, the drivers knew this. So they actually fitted a second battery on the passenger floorboard. And even if you look over here, they took taillight lenses from another Alfa Romeo and they mounted them above the gauges so they could see their gauges at night. Because, you know, the little Magneti Morelli generator that was on right. this car would have had a hard time keeping up with the lighting. And that's why they put the second battery in. Again, this is a car that has hollow door pockets, plastic windows on the side. Um, the body is extremely thin. The opening panels are aluminum. These are, these are very specialized vehicles. They don't look any different than their, their road car counterparts. But when you start to see the detail things like pencil thin aluminum bumpers and aluminum rear overhead, they, what they call the airplane light for the back of the car, these are very unique features. So this car, so let's back up a second. The Lancia the Spider, you think will sell in the 8 to 1.2 range? I would say it's not going to go that high. I think it's going to be more like in the 8 to maybe 850, 875. Which makes it uh, almost half price from where the market, what, the peak of the market was. And absolutely. And then you and I both know where things are cyclic. The next cycle, it'll be five to seven years out and the cars well, will never go back to their old The other thing, Bill, when a market is going through a slight softening, it allows you to buy more car for the same money. Absolutely. That's what people are doing right now. They're, they're cherry picking out the cars that they've wanted before but couldn't find or couldn't afford and now they can and they're not taking any time. And so the lightweight we think is, is going to be somewhere around 300,000 and that's on Bring a Trailer right now? Yep. And that'll end tomorrow, I think 11 o'clock in the morning, West Coast time. Okay, and what's the next car? Uh, the final car that we have here is the 1957 Maserati 300S, uh, the ex factory team Fangio car. Uh, this is a Fantuzzi Long Nose Spider. Uh, again, a car that when you look at it, it already looks like it's going 200 miles an hour just standing still. Um, the, you can see the pronounced long nose on it, it's very low. It was very great at penetrating the air. Uh, these use an inline twin cam, three liter, six cylinder engine with dry sump lubrication. The motor is absolutely beautiful on these cars, as is the radiator. When you see this, you just know the Italians had it right. And so, Bill, this is a, a, about a $6 million car. And what you were telling me that is within this price range, you won't find a car that has this performance and this verified history. No, not, not even close. If you, if you're... If you wanted to have this kind of performance, you really have to switch to something like a 290mm, a Ferrari 290mm, a 315 Sport, a 335 Sport, um, a 412mi. You're going to be spending upwards of 25 to $40 million. Um, the, and three, the, the main advantage of the 300S that, that people who know love them for is that these cars can be driven on the street just like a Maserati 3500 Vignali Spider or a 3500 Coupe. That's why these cars are so fantastically fun and popular in the Millimilia, because you can put thousands and thousands of kilometers on the engine between overhaul. And when you talk about a Ferrari, you're looking at 50 to 60 hours between overhauls on the engine. So, so the difference is, is and so Bill, you've got and the last part that we have you today, can get away with on the Maserati. Okay, show us this. All right, look at that. So this is a, this is the transaxle right here. And uh, these transaxles were just so ahead of their time and so good that when, when Sterling Moss, he told me this himself, when Sterling left Maserati and went to race for Aston in 1958, he was driving the DDR1 and practicing getting ready for the Nürburgring. And the gearbox was designed by David Brown and it just sucked. It was just horrible. So he got his friends at Maserati to send them a, a Maserati transaxle. They fitted it to the DDR1 and he was shaving four, five, six seconds a lap off his lap times practicing for the Nürburgring. David Brown came down and saw the lap charts and couldn't believe it. And he said, what, what, are you, what are you doing different? And he opened up the back and showed him the transaxle. You know what David Brown said? Get rid of it. <laughs> so that was ego took over. And of course, you know, the gearbox the, the last, thing always let them down. 
the last car we talked about today, which you don't have here, is the 1989 Porsche 930 Turbo. Let me ask you two questions as we wrap things up here. First of all, if you were to give any piece of advice to somebody watching today who's thinking about owning a classic car, what would that be? Uh, research. Do as much research as you possibly can. Ask all the hard questions. Uh, remember, when you're buying a vehicle, especially vehicles like this, you're buying out of your heart and passion. You're not always using your brain. Uh, it's always great to get a second opinion, talk to a family member, um, talk to somebody you think might talk you out of it because most of the time it's better not to buy a car than it is to buy it, to be honest. A lot of mistakes are going to be had by buying the wrong car. So really do your homework. So tell me, if you, if you uh, won the lottery tonight uh, and the check cleared, which of these four cars would you take home with you? Well, price sensitive, I would, and I won the lottery, I'd take the Maserati. Uh, if you throw the pricing out of it, I got to say the Lancia. The Lancia is the more fun car to, and it's actually more usable friendly in every event you can think of. It's the one universal car that no matter what event you enter, they won't turn you down. You're guaranteed entry at Le Mans Classic, Mille Amelia, Targo Forio, Porto Auto, which you see the Tour de France, you know, Goodwood, Silverstone, Pebble Beach, Villa d'Este. There's nobody that's going to say no. As a matter of fact, so they, Bill, they'll beg is, you to bring is, it. This has been a great one lap tour of Symbolic International. You've been a wealth of information. Uh, here's some information about how to contact you. Uh, we, look, we hope that when we touch base with you again, you have uh, all these four cars are gone and you have new, four new cars to show us. And I appreciate your support of Sports Car Market over the past 30 years. Good luck with your collecting, Bill. Thank you very much, Keith.